Happy Wednesday, Dog Nation. Welcome into Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. Fun and busy show for us. Mike Griffith later on. New details, potentially anyway, in Georgia's pursuit of a defensive backs coach. We will talk about that on the program. We will preview the SEC schedule drop that comes at uh, 2 p.m. today. So a lot of ground to cover on so many things. So glad to have you with us. Uh, Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Harris Cherokee Resort. Find us online at caesars.com slash Harris Cherokee. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. All right, a lot of news, a lot of ground to cover on today's show. One of the interesting topics that's been out there for a while is who Georgia might hire as its defensive backs coach. We will get to that coming up in a moment. Before that, though, a a pretty key update on a story that's been kind of out there for a while that's really just kind of more probably inside baseball of to go back to like the Bill Clinton era what is the the definition of what the word is is when it comes to Will Muschamp and his status in and around Athens and maybe around UGA for uh, 2021 there'd been some reporting that he was going to be an off-field quality control analyst Georgia pushed back on that pretty hard Georgia coach Kirby Smart kind of pushing back on that a little bit last week Chip Towers who had reported that though has gone and dug up some receipts here good job by chip on this let me show you this on the screen uh jamie Kennedy, who by the way is a fairly regular commenter to our facebook uh, page uh will uh, Ch- uh, chip towers puts that on twitter that uh, will muschamp's quote visit to talk ball which is how muschamp had described this to towers keeps getting longer chip writes on twitter he was back at buttsmere heritage hall all day where he's been every day for a week now chip says and now he's posing with at&t installer jamie Kennedy. Kennedy, who's bringing uh, Muschamp's new Oconee home online. And sure enough, Chip shares the photo of Kennedy with Will Muschamp, apparently who is now living in a new home there in the Athens area somewhere. So there you go, I guess. Muschamp spending a lot more time around Georgia. Now, does that mean that he's officially working at UGA or just that he's got the freedom to choose to hang around? His son Jackson is there as a preferred walk-on. I'm not quite so sure about that one way or another as I said before, you can get a little tedious trying to like really identify all the potential definitions of all these terms, but in a roundabout way, I, I guess Muschamp, you know, being around the Georgia program is probably a good thing. I, I do think that there is some some real knowledge that he brings. You know, it's almost like you ever watch uh, you know some of these TV shows. They talk about like when organizations try to figure out how to defeat themselves they call it red teaming you know you put a red team together to kind of identify your own weaknesses and vulnerabilities Muschamp's coached a lot against Georgia at South Carolina even got a win against UGA going back to 2019 season if you want someone who can do the self-scouting who can help you work on yourself Will Muschamp hanging around the UGA program is probably a pretty good example of someone who's able to do that he's also a good friend of Kirby Smarts I think one of the things that we like about Georgia is the vibe around the program obviously Obviously, Georgia is a program that's serious about winning. But Georgia is a program, I think, led by Kirby Smart that doesn't always take itself too seriously. Smart has, through all of the you know the hard work over the last five years of being a coach in the SEC, has has kind of found a way to still be a guy, you know, not just a man in charge of a football program, but a guy who's you know willing to have some fun or capable of having some fun, things like that. There was a great moment. You want to go back to like the early spring, back when like quarantine was really at its apex, when everyone was getting acquainted with the video tech you know, tele- teleconference technology and things like that. And Muschamp and Smart were supposed to get together on CBS Sports. And if you really want to get a window in why Smart might enjoy having Muschamp around the UGA football facility right now, this little audio clip, clip I'm going to play for, for you from a video they both did together with CBS Sports back in, you know, during the spring really gives you a sense of just how genuinely friendly they are with each other and how much they enjoy having having fun around each other. And I, I got to say, if Muschamp is truly going to be hanging around more around Athens, I don't think this is a bad vibe to have around the program. This is pretty funny from Kirby. Listen to this. Will, I hope you're hearing all this. He's hearing it. He can't talk. He's trying to call his video guy, so he can't get it done. I hope y'all <laughs> air it just like this. Hey. He makes fun of everybody else not being able to get anything done. <laughs> 
<laughs> the Jamie K talk right now. It's killing. Can you hear me now? Oh, he got oh. it. He got it. He got hey. it. The best Go Adam is all this time we've been hearing these stories about Coach Saban and his technical uh, ability to get on internet and do email, and we crack jokes about Zoom and. His poor video guy, man. Nick's video guy has got to like do everything to get it set up for him. And Will, Will needed his video guy this morning, so he's showing his age. When we were at LSU, we went to Exos, which is all computer. So when we first get when we first got there, Nick would only work with beta tape, so you had to insert it in and out. Well, I was always by the computer, and I would always just click to go to the next play or the next segment that we wanted to watch. And for four years, Nick asked me, "Is it rewound yet?" And I had to explain to him, it doesn't <laughs> rewind anymore. And finally, I just quit. I quit saying, yeah, coach, just rewound. We're good to go. We're good to go. Hey, that was my rookie year out of coaching. And I had to carry, like, beta tapes, almost almost like VCR tapes. I had to carry 30 tapes over to the yeah. meeting room from my office. And I was like, why are we taking these tapes? Because they're all on the computer. You can just click on them on the computer. And he wanted the tapes there. He didn't trust the computer was going to work. <laughs> so he was like, that computer break- you better have those tapes. And I was like, okay. So I carried these tapes every day to the meeting. I'm like, it's right here on the computer. (laughs) So first of all, I think it's kind of funny to think about Kirby Smart back in the stage of his career when he was carrying tapes for somebody else. It's kind of hard to imagine that now that he's, you know, the general in charge of the Georgia program. But the other thing is, you know, the back and forth must chant with Smart with very little interruption from the media guy. I believe that's Adam Zucker who's performing the interview. You get the sense that, you know, the vibe they have with each other and that kind of, you know, that kind of vibe around the Georgia football program, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it probably makes the football office a pretty fun place to be around. I think that kind of fun can be contagious. I think good attitude contributes towards, you know, winning. And by the way, it also seems like hanging around that place, probably a pretty fun thing to do. However, if Muschamp is indeed going to be around Georgia, there is increasing reason to believe that he is not going to be Georgia's defensive backs coach. In fact, let me kind of pivot to that right now. There is new chatter about a new candidate on the scene for this job. I'm going to show you this on Twitter, 24 7 in sports reporters up in Morgantown, West Virginia, uh, Mike uh, Casaza, I believe is how you say his name. He says on Twitter that, quote, it's sources say time of year and sources say one West Virginia football assistant has interviewed for a job with an SEC team. What you find out is, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, and I certainly don't intend to mispronounce it, but uh, Jamil Aday is the kind of co-defensive coordinator, West Virginia defensive backs coach. I'll show you that quote in a minute. Let's hold off on the quote just for right now, please. Let me tell folks about him a little bit more. Uh, Jaleel, uh, Jamil Ade is his name. And this is a guy that I had never heard of until probably like the last 24 hours or so. But when you see some of the online chatter, you do see a day now popping up as a very, very seemingly real candidate for this job. And you very quickly realize in studying a day and figuring out what he's all about that He should be a candidate for the job. I don't know if who's going to ultimately get the job. I really don't know. There seems to be a lot of momentum building about this. A lot of online chatter, including what I just showed you there from 24-7 Sports. But certainly this looks to be a pretty impressive uh, impressive coach. Let me give you a little bit of background on a day at West Virginia. You may remember that Vic Croning was a pretty well-known West Virginia defensive coordinator before the start of last season. He had some – I don't even – quite remember what it was that he said but some unfortunate things that kind of popped up you know quotes attributed to him that were not you know pleasant bad enough that West Virginia chose to move on from him I don't remember all the details but I just kind of remember the basic gist of the story that West Virginia kind of late in the process before last season moved on from uh, Vic Croning the defensive uh, coordinator which kind of threw West Virginia into a loop and essentially Neil Brown the West Virginia coach did not replace Cronin as defensive coordinator, split those duties up amongst other coaches on the staff, including uh, a day who sometimes when we say co-defensive coordinator. It's, you know, it, it's not really, you know, a co-defense coordinator situation. It's title only. But in a day's case, I guess he really was involved in this. And there was a really good story that Bruce Feldman did at the athletic about this near the end of last season, talking about the success that West Virginia had defensively. Now, first of all, that in itself is a headline when a program has good defensive success in the Big 12, that league has just not really been known for that. But uh, West Virginia had done a, a great job defensively this year. Some of the stats that, you know, at one point in time, they were fewest yards per play allowed in the uh, Big 12, uh, pass efficiency defense leading the Big 12 in that, red zone touchdown percentage. 
Also, this stood out to me from the Bruce Feldman story. He says that this is at the end of November, so the numbers could have changed slightly before the end of the season. But uh, West Virginia ranked fourth nationally uh, in total defense after ranking 74th in that category uh, back in 2018. That's before Neil Brown took over. So not only did West Virginia kind of navigate the the waters of losing its defensive coordinator that it expected to have, but the performance defensively shot way up to the point that West Virginia was not just a good defense by Big 12 standards, it was just a good defense, one of the better defenses in the country, and the defensive back play led by a day was apparently a reason uh, for that. In that story from Feldman at The Athletic, of course, you, you need a subscription to read the entire thing, but I'll put a link to it when I post the show at adognation.com later on. There was one quote in particular that really stood out to me when uh, Jill uh, Jamil Aday was asked, how are you getting this out of your guys? How are you making this happen? You want some of this attitude potentially at Georgia if he truly is a candidate for this job? Can we share this quote? I want to read this. <laughs> Aday says, we don't have a crap load of four and five star players. We're blue collar. Uh, what's going to set us apart? Set us ahead, he asks. That effort and that attitude. And elsewhere in the story, he talked about how important it was to kind of show up and play with full effort and play with full attitude. Well, guess what? Georgia does have a lot of former four- and five-star guys. But a blue-collar mentality, I think, serves everyone well in every facet when it comes to football. And if a day really can bring that to the table, then his name maybe should be near the top of the list for who can be Georgia's defensive backs coach. I told you guys this, you know, when we first started talking about this opening, Charlton Warren, of course, now officially uh, uh, Indiana's defensive coordinator, that there was a very good chance that who Georgia hired would not be someone any of us had heard before, even though those of us who love college football and follow the sport as closely as we possibly can. This may be an example of that. This is a guy that I'd never heard of at all at the beginning of this week, and yet in reading up on him and studying up on him, all of a sudden now I'm not quite so sure this isn't the guy that I hope gets the job. He seems like a sharp coach. He's done great work at a program and in a conference that's not known for playing great defense. If Georgia can get a uh, 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 you know, Jamil a day away from West Virginia, it looks like the program will have made a pretty good hire. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented today by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort, and we're glad to have you with us no matter how you get to us today. Live on video, 10 a.m., Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, on the radio at noon, of course, on Athens Sports Radio 960, the ref, and we are available as a podcast wherever you find them, including the world-famous dognation.com. It is Mike Griffith coming up just a little bit later on. We'll have him on the program here today. Before we get to that, let me say a huge, huge thank you to our friends at Harris Cherokee Casino resort for making all of this possible here today and let me remind you that when you need that getaway right now i know you do no better getaway just two hour drive from atlanta than both the harris cherokee casino resort properties whether it be the original harris cherokee casino resort or the harris cherokee valley river uh tremendous dining options shopping a great entertainment a world-class luxury spa a totally reimagined gaming floor with socially distant you know, really kind of taking that very seriously, giving you a chance to have fun, while also the peace of mind that knows with coming uh, it comes with knowing that your health and safety is well taken care of. Uh, Harris Cherokee Casino Resort just doing great things, huge things coming there in 2021 there as well that you want to find out more about. In fact, here's where you can go to find out about everything going on and to become a Caesars Rewards member. How about Caesars.com slash Harris dash Cherokee? That's Caesars.com slash Harris dash Cherokee for a whole lot more information about that. All right, it is Dog Nation Daily presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort today. Mike Griffith coming up in just a moment. Before that, though, let's go around the doghouse here delivered today by our friends at Marco's Pizza. And in this spot, the last couple of days, we've ended up talking a lot about UGA recruiting. And today it's going to be another example of that. I said this on the show yesterday that it's always kind of interesting to know the moment in which you kind of transition from the previous recruiting cycle to now you're like in the new recruiting cycle. And even though Georgia's still got some, you know, potential big addition for the 2021 class of Terry and Arnold, I don't think there's any denying that Georgia is in its 2022 cycle right now. That's happening. That is uh, ongoing. We've been kind of highlighting some of the big names who are getting ready to make their announcements. Let me give you another one of those right now. Kristen Miller, very uh, good-looking defensive line prospect 
from the uh, Atlanta area. Uh, he's getting set to make his announcement. Let me show you on Twitter what he's had to say about that. He says decision is made. Going to be committing uh, on uh, April the 4th, he said. Uh, so he's looking forward to doing that. You're talking about uh, you know the number nine, uh, I should say number 10 defensive tackle in the country according to the 24-7 sports composite team ranking and the number 17 player overall in the state of Georgia. So he's getting ready to make a, a big decision. Obviously, Georgia would like to be a part of that. You can kind of add that to the other names we've been talking about in recent days who are all getting ready here in the early stages of spring, really prior to what we think eventually might be uh, an end to the dead period that seems to have lasted and recruiting forever and forever and forever. We saw the 2021 class essentially have to make its decision without much in the way of visits. And some of these 2022 guys apparently kind of thinking something along the same lines, including Christian Miller right there, getting close to making his big announcement. That's one worth watching. Something else I'll encourage you to check out is Jeff Sintel at DogNation.com. Very interesting piece yesterday when it comes to Malachi Starks. Starks is a five-star athlete from Jefferson, probably a defensive back, safety-type player uh, at the major college level. And admittedly, if we're going to say, well, you know, Terry and Arnold, the big defensive back that Georgia's still pursuing for the class of 2021, is not greatly impacted by uh, the decision of Charlton Warren to leave to go to Indiana because of the relationship that that Arnold already had with Kirby Smart. You know, Starks may be someone, when you read the story from Jeff Sintel, who was a little more connected to Warren. And in fact, in the story itself, uh, Starks admitted that, yeah, he was a little disappointed to hear that, that Charlton Warren was not going to be at UGA. But he also had some very good things to say about Georgia there as well. This is a crucial recruitment for Georgia for its 2022 class. And it sounds like Georgia could have maybe a little bit of work to do with Starks, depending on who its new defensive backs coach is going to be and obviously battling a, a pretty strong pursuit from Clemson there I always kind of remember when I was a kid you know going to these uh, Georgia football games we drive you know up 129 or across 129 to get to Athens and you know right there at 85 there in Jefferson you have all those Clemson fans kind of getting on the highway too so Jefferson's really not that far from Clemson in some respects so they're trying to make a big push on Starks and trying to see what they can kind of get going with that and obviously Georgia trying to do the same thing. Pretty good update from Jeff Sintel on Malachi Starks, the things that he likes about Georgia, the connection he feels to the program, and obviously maybe a little bit of a reset needed after Charlton Warren's departure for Indiana. Pretty interesting stuff all the way around. It's Around the Doghouse, delivered today by Marco's Pizza, America's most beloved pizza, real, authentic pizza made the Italian way. And, of course, I invite you to check it out, whether it be the traditional pizza, which obviously you've known and loved for a long time, or maybe you need to become acquainted with the pizza bowl there at Marco's Pizza. It's all the great pizza flavor without the crust. you got all kinds of options, like the all-meat, the garden, the deluxe. A really, really cool way if you're trying to do maybe less carbs here in the new year. That's a great way for you to do that. Find out more about Marco's Pizza. Go to the Marco's app or online at marcos.com as Marco's Pizza delivers around the doghouse to us here today. When we have Mike Griffith, we'll talk a little bit about the defensive backs coaching search. And I also want to get into him, get in with him on the other big news that's going to come later on today, and that is the dropping of the SEC schedule on TV this afternoon at 2 p.m. We actually previewed the possibility of this on yesterday's show, and now it is going to happen. So we'll touch on what that might look like and so much more. Mike Griffith, and it's great to have you with us here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. And we'll settle to Mike Griffith here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. Always great to get a chance to uh, talk to him. Uh, Mike, hello to you. Thanks for being with us, and I uh, hope you're doing well today. Uh, certainly appreciate your time. Oh, thanks, D.A. So before we get into some of the coaching search stuff that I was talking about a moment ago, let me also touch on the other big news that I haven't had a chance to address that we are going to find out about the SEC schedule today at 2 p.m. I reckon I'm thinking, to use a Southern phrase, I reckon I think this is going to be pretty similar to SEC schedules that we got used to seeing prior to the 2020 season. In other words, I'm assuming it's eight-game conference schedule. I'm assuming it's dates around where we typically would think they should be floored on October 30th as a for instance I guess I'm not necessarily expecting it to look different than it's supposed to but I'm also kind of on guard for anything else that might happen just given how weird the last 12 months have been you know what would you say your expectations are for the schedule when it comes out today 
Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you, B.A. B. I, I don't expect anything too crazy uh, coming out with the schedule. I mean, I think it's pretty much the schedule that was going to be in place. And, you know, I would expect they would go back to eight games, especially after, you know, they really weren't rewarded for playing 10. I mean, Notre Dame got that final playoff spot uh, over Texas A&M. Uh, you know, and that was, <laughs> you know, that was going to be debated for a while. Um I don't know how vociferously, but uh, you know, certainly the good news for Georgia is the rivals rotated off uh, the panel. You got to give, you got to tip your cap to the Oklahoma athletic director. You know, able to get his team in over Georgia uh, once and then once again, and uh, you know the Florida and Georgia Tech athletic director certainly played their role. Um, and, and so now they're off, right? So now you have a Kentucky AD that's going in there. But season wise, schedule wise. Uh, I don't expect too many changes. I think Tennessee will remain a, a later season opponent. Uh, we know that uh, both Auburn and Georgia wanted that game moved up uh, from November, and they needed to find another dance partner, and uh, Philip Fulmer was able to do that do si do before he uh, exited the dance floor. You know, when you have a league like the SEC where there are so many good teams, I mean, I think in any year the thing that's really interesting, and it's one of the reasons why you know, there's some stuff online right now about, oh, who's got the toughest SEC schedule in 2021, stuff like that. Mike, it's really hard for me to get too excited about doing any kind of, well, who's got the toughest schedule until we see how these games are ordered because I'm a huge believer that the toughest thing in college football is to play with a level of consistency week after week after week. And so, I mean, I think that I'm going to be much more ready to do the who's got the tough schedule, who's ready to, you know, to kind of face some challenge in the upcoming season. Once once we get an idea for how the really tough opponents are clustered together on certain team schedules. So even if it's a relatively normal schedule, that order in which the games come, I think is going to be really interesting. Yeah, we said that this year. You know, we talked a lot about Georgia having a front-loaded schedule, you know, with the new offense and, you know, just kind of trying to settle in and, and not really having much margin for error, not really being able to play a lot of guys. There was a lot of close games, you know. They they struggled out of the gate against Arkansas. They trailed at halftime uh, at home against Tennessee. You know, those two Zamir White runs uh, stopped at the one-yard line right before the half. And, and then uh, Alabama was a dogfight, of course. Kentucky was no pushover, 14-3. Physical game that, that that saw you know many Georgia players injured and Richard LeCount with his with his horrible motorcycle accident that night. Um, it was a very difficult, tough front stretch of the season leading into that game in Florida uh, against the Gators, just a few miles away from Jacksonville, and a, a tough loss there as well. Once Stetson Bennett got injured, so you kind of wondered maybe if you could have sprinkled in that Missouri or that South Carolina or that Vanderbilt. Well, I, I can't say Vanderbilt because they decided to no show twice. Uh, there at the end, uh, I guess everybody's given Vanderbilt a free pass for quitting on the league. But uh, had maybe you, you gotten to play one of those games earlier where you could have played some of the younger guys, you know, where maybe you don't have so many guys injured, where maybe the locker room is a happier place because more guys are getting repetitions. Uh, you know, but instead it just wasn't like that. So I, I completely agree with you that the order that you play teams, and the other thing, B.A., that we saw a couple years ago, speaking of uh, Georgia getting screw jobs from the SEC office, was was five opponents having a bye week before they played Georgia one year, and you know Georgia only having two, but you know bye weeks before they played a team, and and both of those teams, uh, Florida and Tennessee, also had byes. So Georgia had no leg up on anybody. That uh, was in the uh, what was that the 2018 campaign, I believe, or maybe it was the 2019 campaign. 2019 campaign. So we we've seen Georgia uh, get hit hard by the league office with scheduling. Um, you know, the last couple of years, whereas we saw Florida kind of get a break last year, they got, you know, they, they, they didn't have the back-to-back -back road games. And, you know, they were due to play Alabama. And the, instead, the league kind of tore it up and gave them a different schedule. So uh, let's see with Josh Brooks in office if, if maybe there could be a little more equity in the schedule this year. So one of the things that uh, I had talked about on the show a couple of weeks ago is that you know, when it comes to being a fan, there's a coaching surge. You know, I, I sort of want Georgia to get the biggest name it can hire. Usually it's just kind of more fun, more interesting to talk about. But when it comes to Georgia hiring you know, defensive assistants, we've seen a, a you know, relatively impressive track record of Kirby identifying diamonds in the rough. You know, guys that you know didn't have huge resumes before Kirby hired them, and they've I would say gone to Georgia to have you know really good success. And there was a very good chance that Georgia could hire a coach I'd never heard of, and yet I, as a fan, I could be really glad that Georgia had that guy. I spent a few minutes before you joined us talking about uh, Jamila Day, the uh, defensive backs coach, co-defense coordinator, I guess you can call him from uh, West Virginia. Mike, this is someone who. 
I had never heard of at all before, probably 24 hours ago. There's been a lot of online chatter about him over the last little bit. And, Mike, I think I'm in love. I mean, this is a very impressive coach, a a guy who's gotten big things uh, with Neil Brown's defense there in Morgantown in a league that doesn't play a ton of defense. West Virginia really did a year ago after being kind of in a tough spot because of an unexpected defensive coordinator departure. I have no idea who's going to get this job, but um, all of a sudden, a day is one of those guys that, you know, he may leap ahead on my personal list of some more well known defense backs coaches because of the work that he was doing at West Virginia and the attitude he seems to bring as a coach. Can you tell us anything about this situation? Uh, yeah, Jamal Adai is a guy that, you know, had played West Virginia. He was a safety there. He was an all conference player back in the day. Uh, spent a lot of time out in Arizona. He played, uh, Mike, against Arsenal. Georgia in the 2005 Sugar Bowl, the one played in Atlanta, but he played against uh, Georgia in the 05 Sugar Bowl. Yeah, you know, all conference safety there when he was with West Virginia and, you know, spent the last five, you know, spent uh, the last couple years with the Mountaineers, as you mentioned. They actually led the nation in fewest passing yards allowed. I mean, that's one you wouldn't expect any Big 12 team to lead the nation in in fewest pass yards allowed, which might say something about their run defense, but I think it also says something about their pass defense because they were also in the top 25 in pass efficiency defense. So even when teams threw the ball, uh, they had some trouble. So he comes out of a good system, a really good communicator. Mike, can I interrupt you for one second? Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we can now report it is official. Uh, Jamil Ade is the Georgia uh, 247 Sports, I guess, reports first. Georgia has now confirmed Ade is the defensive backs coach. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, Jamal Adai is uh, the pronunciation. I okay, actually went you. to their, their media guide to, thank you. to get it. Jamal thank Adai. You. So, thank yeah, you. A, a guy that's very popular with the players. Um, you know, a guy that, uh, you know, I think is, is going to make an impact. And it's an important hire for Georgia as well, when you consider the, the turnover. Uh, you know, I guess not, not that Prather Hudson was a difference maker, but, um, you know, you've had nine scholarship DBs depart the team since the end of the 2019 season. So a lot of turnover back there. Really only one guy that started last season as a starter was Lewis Seen. And then, of course, you know, Christopher Smith took over once, uh, you know, Richard LeCount had the motorcycle accident. But that's a, that's a very inexperienced group back there. And uh, they're going to need a guy that can teach him and relate well with him. So, Mike, I'm a big believer that, you know, listen – when we've had these kinds of conversations over the years, I almost always lean in the direction of recruiting for something like this. That's almost always the direction I want to see Georgia go. And uh, Adai may turn out to be a, a very good recruiter in his own right. Obviously, it's hard to judge that at West Virginia because they don't recruit the same level of player that Georgia does. But for this particular season, given the fact that Georgia does have talent in that defensive back room, but it is not experienced talent, I have said now a couple of times that I almost favor for this year bring in someone who's going to be a technician, who's going to be a instructor, who's going to be you know someone who helps this current crop of secondary players get their ducks in a row for the upcoming season, and then worry about recruiting after that. Because frankly, if Georgia does what it needs to do on the field this year, recruiting will probably take care of itself as a byproduct of that. So if that's what I've called to a happen here, this certainly seems to be that kind of coach, someone who may be a good recruiter, but has demonstrated at a place with far less measurable talent than Georgia, his ability to be an on-field coach. So for that reason, as much as anything, I certainly celebrate the move. Oh, no doubt. And, you know, when you're Georgia, you, you should be able to hire somebody that can coach and recruit. I mean, you, you, you know, you're not, you're not running around in a situation like Tennessee was. You know, you take a look at what they ended up, you know, uh, hiring there as the head coach. You, you're, you're able to go out and get some top-level talent, um, especially when you consider how these guys have, have moved on. When you look at previous Georgia coaches like Sam Pittman and Shane Beamer and, and Mel Tucker, all head coaches now, right? Kevin Shear and and, um, you know, recently Charlton Warren, both promoted uh, from position coaches at Georgia to defensive coordinator. So, I mean, this is a – Georgia's a great place to coach to advance your career. And, um, you know, I think that's something that Jamal Adai probably sees and recognizes and the opportunity to work with Kirk Smart as well. Um, West Virginia allowed 159.6 yards per game through the air a year ago. That was best in the country. Mike, to put up those kinds of numbers, only uh, 6.3 yards per attempt allowed. Uh 
to put up those kinds of numbers in the Big 12, a league that's typically known for really, really prolific passing attacks, that's a that's a huge performance from Neil Brown's team a year ago. And you know what I've read online about this gives a die some of the credit for uh, what kind of you know caused that to happen. So I think a guy with a real track record for on field success is coming in here. Oh, no doubt. You know, the interesting thing is he also spent a couple years as a running back. It's kind of like Kirby Smart. Remember Kirby coached that year running backs under Mark Richt? And you go back deep enough into a dye's resume, and, he, you know, he coached running backs a couple of years at Cincinnati, back when they had Isaiah Pete. Um, you know, interesting guy, though. Uh, was once named uh, among the top recruiters in the nation by Rivals.com. Um, so, you know, this is a guy who's gotten it done on the recruiting trail, on the field, and, you know, like you referenced there, you know, he comes from a defense that, that really did quite well against the pass, especially when you consider that, you know, he's in the Big 12. You, you know, we kind of consider that the wild, wild west of offense. Yeah, no doubt. So we'll have more on this throughout the day on DogNation.com. Mike's actually got a story up on this, and we will continue to cover this. And obviously here on Live on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort as well. Let me kind of just reset what has happened here. This was a possibility when the show began, and it has now been confirmed by Georgia that uh, – um, um, Okay, so it's just reportedly. Uh, so 24-7 Sports is reporting here. I'm getting all of this coming in that Georgia has hired its new defense backs coach. So not confirmed, I guess, yet uh, as I'm on the air here. But um, but reportedly, uh, give us the pronunciation one more time, Mike. We're going with Jamal Adai. Is that what we're going with here? Yeah, it's Jamal Adai. Correct. Oh. All right, good stuff there. All right, so let me uh, then uh, transition to this. Um very funny uh, tweet by our buddy Chip Towers last night. A more photographic evidence of Will Muschamp hanging around the uh, city of Athens right now. Uh, spending some time, uh, Chip's continuing to report around the Buttsmere Heritage Hall. What do you think is going on with Will Muschamp? Whatever he wants to be going on. You know, look, the guy's just got paid $13 million, well, $12.9 million. His son plays it. He's good, he's good friends with Kirby Smart. Uh, Kirby pretty much does what he wants over there. And if he wants Will Muschamp in and out of that facility without being a fish out staff, those guys can play that game all summer. They'll do what they want when they want to do it. That's that's the life of being a multi-millionaire, uh, being a powerful coach like Kirby is. And, you know, Muschamp's his friend. I mean, Muschamp gave him the break uh, back when he got into coaching. Uh, back in the day, Valdosta stays a DB coach. That was Will Muschamp that helped him, you know, and – and uh, all, they've stayed friends all these years. And even when I covered other schools, it was known, and the coaches would talk about the alliance that South Carolina and Georgia had, even in recruiting. If you know if one wasn't going to get them, you know they, you know the other one was. And, you know they worked together and things like that. So this is no surprise. They're allies. They're friends. Uh, they're very you know similar guys. I mean, most champ came through Georgia right before Kirby. I think they overlapped one year, maybe. Uh, didn't really get to be close friends until later, though, when they served uh, on the same staff. Uh, they think a lot alike. I mean, we saw Muschamp come in here and, and beat Kirby Smart. Probably knows Kirby about as well as anybody. Um, had a, that was one of those bye week games we talked about. You know, one of those teams that had a bye week before Georgia. But uh, you know, so they'll they'll do what they want to do. I mean, that's that's the thing. You know, this isn't. Uh, you know, no one's going to tell Kirby, hey, you know, you're going to have to make sure you did. Look, Kirby will tell Kirby will tell the athletic department when it's time to make this official, right? And it's not a money issue. Um, so, you know, and, and who knows, maybe Muschamp will never officially be hired. Maybe, you know, like I said, with $13 million and his son being here, maybe he'll decide I'll show up when I want to show up. Um, so they can do whatever they want. I'm just going to tell you, that's, that's how they roll. And, yes, he's been around the program for over a month, and the reason why they were so uh, vociferous that it wasn't an official hire was because he hadn't got his lump sum yet. So I think it's correct that he's been around the program and working with the program, but technically not hired, as Georgia made the statement last week, because they didn't want to gum up uh, Muschamp getting his settlement from South Carolina. But now that bulk payment's been made, I reported last week, uh, you know, Georgia's free to move forward with the paperwork when they're ready, whenever Kirby Smart decides it's time or whenever Will Muschamp. Those guys make the rules. And just to be clear here, Jamal Adai is officially hired by Georgia. Georgia has announced that. So sorry for the confusion on that. That is uh, official and has been announced. And, you know, Mike, to the extent that it matters at all, you know, I, I don't know that it matters that Georgia ever officially announces that Muschamp's hanging around the program. And I, I don't know that it matters that he's doing so on a voluntary, voluntary basis or if he's getting paid. Whatever he would be paid would be a very small amount of money compared to what obviously typically SEC coaches make. So, 
you know, kind of the official particulars on this, frankly, I don't find to be very interesting. It kind of gets into, as I said before, almost like the Bill Clinton thing of what the definition of is is related to all this kind of stuff. And, you know, that kind of tedium, frankly, I think most SEC fans are probably allergic to. However, um, I, I do think that because that Kirby and Muschamp are good friends, you know, Muschamp's kind of a, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, he, he's kind of a guy who kind of, you know, has the ability to have some fun the way that I believe the Kirby Smart's capable of doing. Muschamp has coached <laughs> against Georgia a number of years, coached against uh, Kirby Smart a number of years. I do think there is some value in having Muschamp around the program from a self-scouting standpoint, from a, just a different pair of eyes standpoint. I mean, the SEC teams that can really afford to hire the big analysts and have every scouting resource available to them, I do think that that really matters. And so I do think much the same way like Charlie Strong's and Mike Stoops' presence at Alabama, Steve Sarkeesian's presence at Alabama before he became offensive coordinator there, I think big guys like that hanging around a program, what Jay Johnson was for the Georgia offense at one point in time before he left, I think analysts are a, a valuable resource for a program and Georgia having a former SEC coach uh, as an analyst whether it's in a paid capacity or not, or just kind of hanging around the program a little bit, if that's indeed what he's going to do, I think there's probably some value for that for Georgia. Yeah, the only thing would be better is if you had former NFL head coaches doing it, like Alabama right. does with Bill O'Brien and Doug Marone, but, but no doubt about it. You know, I, I think it helps. I mean, you got Matt Luke on the staff. you got Todd Munkin on the staff. Um, you know, so you already got two former head coaches, Luke and SEC coach. Now you got Muschamp. Uh, you know, you don't lack, I don't think you lack for the brain power over there. I really don't. I don't think it's a matter of X's and O's and preparation. I think it comes down to personnel decisions, and I think it comes down to catalysts, having the right guys on the team that can, you know, the straw that can stir the drink. That, you know, look, let, let's just cut to the chase. Uh, you know, we look at the NFL, and what do we see? We're getting ready to watch Tom Brady go to the Super Bowl, and we see the New England Patriots in ruins, right? I think we'd all agree Bill Belichick's a pretty good coach. Um, but, you got to have a quarterback. And I think it's the same at Georgia. I, you know, you'd be coach of the year. Uh, but if you don't have a quarterback, it doesn't matter. And we saw it at Georgia. And now you've got a quarterback. You've got JT Daniels. I don't know who's next. I don't know what's next. I'm now into, you know, predicting where the 8A state champion in Florida is better than a 1A private school. I don't care how much weight they lift. That's all just, that's malarkey, okay? It's football. Are you a player and can you lead? And I don't think you really know that until a guy's on campus. And I don't think it's necessarily a given. I think there's a lot of dynamics involved in team building, and um, certainly with the pandemic, it's unique. But what happens over the course of this offseason for Georgia, I mean, it's going to be big for Kirby Smart, B.A. I mean, it's going to determine his future. I don't know whether Kirby's on a three-year clock, a five-year clock, or a ten-year clock. But I do know that the window uh, with this immediate talent uh, could close quickly. Uh, you know, JT Daniels is a guy that I expect to go pro after next year if he has a big season. Todd Munkin's a guy that I expect to get another job as a head coach or as an NFL offensive coordinator. So Georgia has got to have a good 2021 to maintain that momentum and enable Kirby to keep hiring good coaches, like you said, good analysts, to keep the players coming in here. Very quick final thing, because I've kept you long. Uh, your eyes are obviously on the Senior Bowl this week. That's an event that you know pretty well. Give us, for those of us who are not living and dying with every bench press rep and you know guy who steps on the scales, give us just kind of a thumbnail sketch for what's happening in uh, Mobile, Alabama, which is obviously the birthplace of the great Hank Aaron as well, who uh, continues to be on our mind. But when it comes to the Senior Bowl itself, uh, what's going on there? Yeah, well, it's, it's bigger than ever. It's bigger than ever, B.A., because there's no combine, right? So no combine, you know, these players aren't going to have an opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with the GMs and the head coaches and the personnel directors like they usually do at the NFL combine. And pro day is going to be different because of COVID protocol. So a lot of these uh, head coaches and NFL teams, they're not going to travel to pro days because they can't get in the building, right? They're going to be like, okay, you guys go sit at the stadium wait for the 40. Yeah, okay, I'm not flying to your city for that. So you're not going to have the same number of NFL uh, per decision makers at the pro days. You'll have scouts there, but that's not the same. You're not really talking to the boss. So the exposure that these players are getting is huge. That's why, you know, Monty Rice didn't practice yesterday, but it was still really, really big that he was there because he can meet face-to-face -face with these coaches, and well, through plexiglass at least. He'll have a plexiglass divider, but he's going to be able to meet with these coaches and decision makers and they can lay eyes on him in person. You know, Ben Cleveland brain's ankle, right? You know, but still, Big Ben was down there for the weigh-in. You saw him in person. 
saw massive, what a Goliath Big Ben Cleveland is at 6'6", 354. Uh, you know, even heavier than Isaiah Wilson was a year ago. Let's hope his judgment's better once he makes him in the league. Uh, you know, last the DBs, they're not, they're not off to a great start. Okay, there's really good quarterbacks and really good receivers there. And, uh, you know, Mark Webb is a guy, you know, it's, it's going to be tough on him. Mark needs a good week. You know, he weighed in at 210 BA. A big guy probably projects to safety. Not sure he can really cover uh, well enough to be a corner or a nickel in the NFL. Really needs to, you know, show his open field tackling. These next two days are in full equipment. Uh, Trey McKay, I understand, had a pretty nice catch. He's a guy that's expected to be a better pro than college players. You know, I know Georgia players, Georgia fans roll their eyes and say, hey, he didn't do much. Well, he had, you know, arthroscopic knee surgery and never really got going. And if we're going to be honest, the quarterback situation wasn't the best until the last four games of the season. The other so, thing, too, Mike, uh, is most tight ends. I mean, start, the other thing, I don't mean to me cut you off, but most tight ends actually outperform in the NFL and they do in college. That's one of the things that NFL teams are just better at doing is finding a way to use the uh, tight end. As much as we love tight ends, it, it's hard for a, a, a lot of college teams to get those tight ends involved, right? Yeah, no question. I, I guess I just would have expected more than five catches, right? Fair so, enough. you know, you look at Isaac Nottie had 31 and, and Eli Wolf. But, but to your point, yes, uh, and, and that is exactly what the senior bowl executive director said was that NFL teams are better at you because they have better quarterbacks. Right. right? You've got to have a good quarterback that can get that far into the progression. That's right. And, and, and Georgia didn't early, early on last year. All right, well, Mike, appreciate you being here on our program today. Uh, we'll look forward to reading a lot more from you as Georgia has found its defensive backs coach after a little bit of a dance on the air here. That is official, uh, and uh, we'll look forward to reading a whole lot more from you on that, and we'll all have our eyes on 2 p.m. this afternoon when the SEC schedule comes out. Appreciate it, B.A. Have a good one, man. Good stuff. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. All right, let me show you this on the uh, screen here. Jamal Adai. Uh, announced now officially as Georgia coach. This happening during the show. Uh, by the way, I appreciate Mike helping me out with the pronunciation on this. <laughs> got, he took about a pretty nice job here. Uh, for those of you watching on video, look at the Photoshop from uh, Georgia. You got a die already in the uh, coach's gear. You know the the coat, the hat. So uh, looking pretty good there on that. Uh, pretty well done. Uh, Photoshop. Georgia saying officially on Twitter. Dog Nation, join us in welcoming the newest addition to Georgia football, uh, Coach Adai. They give you his Twitter handle there, uh, Jamal Adai. As we talked about off the top of the program, as a possibility, now it happens. Um, I've been, you know, just based on the online chatter, I've been, you know, studying about this guy a lot of the last 24 hours, really acquainting myself with who he is, and I like him, man. I like him a lot. Now, some of you'd say, well, B.A., you're a Georgia show. You'd have liked whoever Georgia hired. Yeah, you know, maybe that's the case. But, look, when Georgia hired Trey Scott as defensive line coach, he had just been hired by Ole Miss, had not really coached there, had been at North Carolina, a place at the time you couldn't really use as much of a measuring stick for how he would do at UGA. But Trey Scott's turned out to be a very good coach. Georgia is dominant against the run. They've what led the SEC in, in you know, run defense what the last two years you know uh, uh, uh jalen carter looks like a future star trayvon walker looks like a future star jordan davis who scott has coached up is a current star um the georgia defensive line is in great hands with scott and scott was a total unknown when georgia hired him based on his resume dan lanning is someone who i literally had never heard of and obviously you know he's a guy that's going to show up on some head coaching radars by the way more on that in a moment um, you know, Glenn Schumann wasn't a coach before Kirby Smart hired him, and yet look how you know well he's kind of turning out right now too. So there's a lot going on with um, you know these guys. Kirby Smart identifying talent, much the same way you have to identify player talent, you have to also be able to identify coaching talent. And I would say that Smart has turned out to be really good at that. In, in the case of a die, his on-field resume may be a little more substantial because of the situation he was thrown into at West Virginia because of the weirdness with the previous defensive coordinator. But the Mountaineers got it done defensively. So the best that I can tell, Georgia's made a good hire. And specifically speaking, a good hire given the situation facing this team. For now, there's plenty of talent to win. You, you need defensive backs for the class of 2022 and all that kind of stuff. We talked about Malachi Starks before, you know, how Starks views a die will matter. Terry and Arnold, how he views um, will, will matter. But even if Georgia doesn't get anything for now, 
what they've got is enough to win if those guys, inexperienced as they are, get coached up. So this is a big hire for Georgia, and we'll be talking a lot about it. Let me also give a quick shout out to one of my favorite people in our kind of Dog Nation family who you've seen around Dog Nation events for some time. Close personal friend of mine there as well. Someone who's always kind of gone the extra mile and everything I've ever seen from her. And now she's doing that for you. Whether you need to buy a new home, you got to have a strong advocate by your side, someone who knows the market, or whether you're looking to sell a home, someone that can give you more money for your sale potentially with less hassle around all of that. My friend Kelly Grizzard from Atlanta Fine Homes, South, uh, South the Beast International Realty can help you do that to tackle your real estate dreams. She is certainly capable of doing that. A couple different ways for you to get in touch with her. You can reach out to her by email, Kelly Grizzard at AtlantaFineHomes.com. That's Kelly Grizzard at AtlantaFineHomes.com. You can also call her. I'll give you the number here, 404 641 86832. That's 404 641 6832. She's also got a website that she's got as well. Let me throw this up for you as well. Kelly Grizzard dot AtlantaFineHomes.com. Kelly's a big friend of ours here around Dog Nation. You've seen her in a lot of Dog Nation events, and now she's helping you tackle your real estate dreams. Let me roll through here for a couple of other SEC through stories. Talk to Mike about this schedule release a little earlier. I won't say much more about that right now. I do think how the games are ordered matters. I'm at least on the lookout for maybe something about this schedule being different than we've kind of come to expect it to be, but for the most part, it may be traditional release for now, but the one thing you've got to be on guard about, though, is the possibility that all of this changes at some point in time because, I mean, let's, let's, we try to avoid the, the scary stuff in the world here on the show, but the virus is not going anywhere, at least for right now. The vaccine's taking shape and taking form, and uh, we're doing everything we can as a society, but, but you know, things are still tough out there right now. So uh, we'll see how that impacts football as we head towards the fall of 2021. Also, late in the show to be getting into a pretty big piece of news. We may just have to do more on this tomorrow. But uh, Josh Heupel has been hired as Tennessee coach. If I'm a Vols fan, I'm not excited about this. You know, the idea that I've outsourced my entire athletic department, the two most important jobs in an athletic department, athletic director and head coach, essentially outsourcing that to a Group 5 program at UCF. This is not exciting to me at all, especially one that's kind of beclowned itself with, you know, a mock, you know, fake national championship. I just think this is the most unimaginative thing possible. And some of you got mad at me for saying this this week. But given the choice, if I'm Tennessee, of Jeremy Pruitt as head coach or someone like Josh Heupel, who, by the way, you know, seems to be getting worse year after year at UCF. I just rather have Pruitt. I I think the Pruitt would have just been a better coach than what Josh Heupel would be, because, by the way, have you noticed what the previous hot name from UCF that left that program has done? Scott Frost went back to his alma mater, Nebraska. He's about to get fired. I mean, they had a huge number of defections from the program this week, including McCaffrey's brother and everything else. They, uh, they're they a mess. And uh, Frost is not able, seemingly, to do anything about that. That was the guy at UCF who was actually good. Heupel, his replacement, uh, uh really worse performance than what Scott Frost was. So, you know, the notion that somehow this is going to be Tennessee's savior, boy, I find that to be a pretty specious claim. I, I, I do think, specious is the right word, right? I, I, I do think that uh, Heupel was a pretty good offensive coordinator going back to his time at Missouri, so not a bad offensive mind necessarily, but uh, but this is not a big-time hire. This is a guy who I would say his coaching star has kind of fallen, and if the guy that hired him once before wasn't the guy in place at Tennessee, there's almost no way Josh Heupel is on the radar for UCF. Um, I guess watch the possibility, and I hate to say this, but honesty compels me to admit, watch the possibility that Dan Lanning shows up on a list of candidates for that UCF job. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying he's going to take it, and this is not based on any kind of inside information whatsoever. This is just, what was it Dan Patrick said the other day? I'm just going to throw in stuff out there, see what sticks. Just watch out for the possibility that Lanning emerges as a a candidate there at UCF, among a lot of candidates, because, you know, frankly, that UCF job will be pretty attractive to a lot of people. But you could see Lanning's name there. I was going to do another SEC through story, but gosh, we've been going here for a few minutes. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. We'll make that your SEC through. I will give a shout out as well here before we wrap up to Georgia basketball tonight. Desperately needing a win after uh, you know a loss to, to Florida this past weekend. Getting a chance to go to Columbia tonight against South Carolina. You talk about a weird year for college basketball. You know, 
Georgia about to play its 15th game tonight. You've got South Carolina on the other side. They've only played eight games all season long. It's really weird. You look at the SEC standings, the different number of games that's been played for teams. Uh, Columbia's been a tough place to play before, so we'll see Georgia tonight on the road trying to get that third SEC win. And it'll be a good time to do that here, obviously, against uh, South Carolina. Let me also say this as well. We like to do our Gator Hater Roll Call. Now, tomorrow, we should be able to bring back Gator Hater Countdown, so that's fun. But Golden Shoe winner today is part of the Gator Hater Roll Call, Joel Sidney Kelly. We've called his name before. Very, very funny Photoshop. Joel's great at this. Jeremy Pruitt, Dan Mullen, both dressed as clowns. Joel says that Dan was just thrilled that he outlasted Jeremy Pruitt. So appropriate here since uh, Pruitt's replacement has been hired at Tennessee to see Mullen and Pruitt both dressed as clowns here. Joel Sidney Kelly is just terrific at that. He's our golden shoe winner today. Uh, thanks for being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort, and we will see you tomorrow. And on video. Time now for our R.S. Andrews cool down. And that was a lot to cover with a hire made by Georgia during the show. But I do believe it's a good one. We previewed that before it became official there and everything else there. You see Jamal Adai, whose name I butchered, I guess, before uh, Mike kind of set me straight on the pronunciation. But I like him, man. I like him. I think he's a sharp guy. And, you know, obviously, you know, you would have assumed that whoever Georgia hired would be, you know, a pretty sharp guy. But uh, but this guy, he got it done on the field. <laughs> I mean, West Virginia at one point in time was giving up you know million points a game, most of that through the air, and all that's kind of stopped this past year. So uh, pretty impressive work all the way around, and uh, pretty good stuff there when it comes to uh, Jamal Ladai hired as Georgia's defensive backs coach. Um, all right. Tanya Godwin says, just when you think the offseason will be dull, all the breaking news. Yeah, see, this is one of those things, Tanya, I think that's quietly been true for a while, is that December, January, February is quietly pretty exciting. That you think, well, this is just like, because when you're in this kind of winter time of the year, you feel like you're the as far away from football as you ever will be. As you get closer to spring and summer, you feel like you're getting a little closer to all of this, and it starts to get you know pretty exciting. But you know, this is one of those things where last few years it's been true. It's generally always true for college football that when you're in the um, this winter portion of the season, I love coaching carousel stuff. I mean, some of you know this about me. Uh, it's pretty inside baseball. But but the rumors of so-and-so may take this job, and if he does, then so-and-so may emerge as a replacement, and then this may happen, and then that may happen. I love all that stuff. That's you know, That stuff is really, really fun to me. And we're kind of in the midst of all that right now. So uh, pretty good times here. Pretty good times. Frank Crowder says, how about Kendall Bryles? That's an interesting, interesting name. You know, there's less media coverage of UCF. The Sentinel covers them a little bit. But, but you know, there's not a ton of Orlando media coverage. So they could get away with hiring someone like Bryles, whereas that name, fairly or not, and by the way, there's, you know, I think, at some point, I need to revisit some of that Baylor stuff, uh, but um, but fairly or not, the Bryles name still kind of comes attached with some baggage. But it'd be a little easier for a place like UCF to hire him because there's just not much, you know, Orlando media to to talk much about that. Jermaine King says he's late. What did he miss? Jermaine, uh, you missed a lot. George found a defensive backs coach. Um. Got a lot of good stuff going in here. Jeremy Chapman talking about some sort of day trade. Is that GameStop? Is that what you're talking about, Jeremy? <laughs> I don't endorse any kind of uh, day trading stuff, but I did notice some of the GameStop stuff that's been out there. Um, John William Adams says that Trey Scott's development on the field and recruiting is elite. Getting Jordan Davis back is validation. Inside look at the man's ability and trust. He's going to have huge uh, 22 defensive line class with all the Georgia talent available. I think that John's pretty well spot on about that. Uh, Trey Scott's become a hot name, I would say. I mean, he should be anyway in terms of, you know, when you make a list of the Georgia assistant coaches who are really getting it done, you've got to put Scott's name up there very, very close to the top. Because think about, you know, some of the lesser known, lesser heralded type guys. Like Malik Herring had a really good Georgia career. Um, you know, that's a guy that I would say is part of Trey Scott's development. Uh, Devontae Wyatt coming back for Georgia is a big deal. Devontae Wyatt's a good player, I think. And, you know, some of this is, you know, 
very specific scouting. And I'm not going to pretend to have a scout side. There are too many people, you know, trying to do that on the internet as it is. But, um, but I mean, I think by almost anybody's estimation, Devontae Wyatt's a good player. And I think you've got to give Trey Scott a lot of credit for that kind of stuff as well. Jarvis Hanna, good to see you checking in. Uh, Chris Slim White says, how many players do we pick up next week? I mean, I guess it's just the one. I did hear the rumblings about what's his name, uh, linebacker who might be going to Auburn, but I don't even think that's I don't even think that's all that real. Um, Matt Rukavina has a very interesting take. I want to go to YouTube after a couple more comments here. He says Tennessee has now fallen into irreparable harm territory. This has gone from slump to diminished status. I'd put them on par with Ole Miss. I think that's really interesting that. The biggest problem for Tennessee, and um, I did get, uh, you know, one of our, you know, very respected, you know, social media commenters the other day said I was being too nice to Tennessee. So here's one thing that I'm probably different than some of you on, in that as a Georgia fan, I obviously want bad things to happen for Tennessee. But as someone who's kind of like talked about the SEC for a living and, you know, kind of covered this league and, you know, likes the SEC in general, I do feel a certain... Kinship would be too strong of a word, but I'm a little bit sympathetic to Tennessee fans when the program gets this bad. Now, some of you say, well, that be it. It just makes you big old softy. That may be the case, and if that is the case, I'll kind of own it. But, you know, the thing that I notice when I look at the Tennessee situation is what they've been asked to do is be patient for a decade now. And some of what Jeremy Pruitt kind of cost him his job there was the fact that he, he inherited a situation where Tennessee fans just, or maybe Tennessee boosters maybe, but they just didn't want to be impatient anymore. You know, it's almost like Pruitt paid for the sins of Butch Jones and paid for the sins of Derek Dooley. You know, it, it's almost like some of the impatience, because patience is a finite resource. When you spend it on something, you don't have, have it left to give to something else. You know, notice that with your kids. You know, you overlook this, you overlook that, you overlook that. After a while, patience is just gone. And at that point in time, you know, whatever happens next, all of a sudden you snap. Because once patience is gone, you just don't really have it anymore. And, and football fans, I think you're no different. That once you give your patience to some coach who proves unworthy of it, the way that Butch Jones did, the way that Derek Dooley did before that, all of a sudden you don't have it left to give to the next guy. And you better believe that Josh Heupel is certainly stepping into that situation. Now, if you have a chance to go be a SEC coach, you probably take the job. But um, there'll be plenty of coaches who didn't want the job. That's probably why. Um, that's probably why Heupel ends up getting it. Because notice this: I'm always interested in the dogs that don't bark. Notice this: that when Danny White was hired as Tennessee athletic director, there was no media thing of, well, he's obviously going to bring Josh Heupel with him. Nor was there any kind of media thing of, oh, hiring Danny White's a coup because he might be able to bring Josh Heupel with him. That was not really talked about at all because Heupel was just not that big of a prospect. So the fact that now Heupel is the guy lets you know that whatever else they tried, you know, private plane to state college, Pennsylvania, whatever else, um, that, that, uh, that all that kind of stuff just wasn't really working. Uh, Killian Worthy says, I'm more worried about Trey Scott being poached away from Georgia than Dan Lanning. So, Killian, here's what I'll say in response to that, and I think that's an interesting point. The one thing that Georgia can really do now, and I've said this a million times, that for the programs who have money, the issue is how you use your money. There are plenty of things that you can buy, I believe, that don't contribute to winning whatsoever. You put a water slide in your football facility or a waterfall in your weight room. Who cares? I mean, you know... (laughs) You take a recruit on a tour, hey, here's our lazy river around our football facility. I think the parents are like, oh, okay, Uh, where's the, you know, what else you got? (laughs) So there are a lot of things you spend money on that I'm not quite sure really contributes to winning. But when you can give someone like Trey Scott raises year after year after year, continuing to allow him to make more and more money, the the push to go be a defensive coordinator right away just may not exist there as much. I mean, Larry Johnson's been defensive line coach at Ohio State, seems content to, to remain there. 
you know, you, some programs are able to keep position coaches in place for a while. And as long as you take care of these guys, as long as you break them off, um, you know, they're going to be kind of willing to do that. Eventually, obviously, he's going to want promotions, but eventually maybe George is in a position to give him that promotion. But you can bide that time and keep assistance patient as long as you're giving them the financial rewards. Because honestly, you know, making, you know, high six figures – for uh, being a position coach at Georgia, no media scrutiny, um, you know, obviously you got the recruiting thing kind of figured out now. That's not such a bad life, probably. Um, what else is going on over here on YouTube? Cliff Payne on the subject of Tyson Campbell, who you have seen kind of show up in some of these mock drafts. I believe Kuyper had him in the first round there. Um, so here's the one thing I'd say about uh, Campbell. You know, Cliff, I, I think, is being a little too hard on him in his comment. I would say that most people probably said that Campbell looked really good at the start of the 2019 season, then he got hurt. So if you judge him, I mean, if you judge him on the way that he played as a freshman, that's probably unfair because they're not a ton of – I mean, for every Derek Stingley that, you know, basically – best player in the country as a freshman defensive back in the SEC. He did not have as good a sophomore year, by the way. But, you know, he was very good as a freshman. For every Derek Stingley, there's a million other guys who just are not at that level of performance. They're just they're, they're, they're just not. It's a hard position to play as an inexperienced player. I would say that most people would say that, that Campbell looked like a completely different player at the start of his second year, but then he was hurt. You know, 2019 was kind of a lost year for Tyson Campbell. And how he played, you know, this past season, I guess different people would say different things. But, um, you know, Georgia plucked him out of, uh, you know, high school as a five-star recruit and sent him through the program through three years. Even if Georgia didn't, maybe maybe Georgia fans didn't get as much of Campbell as they wanted. But if he showed up on campus and three years later, you know, he's shaking Roger Goodell's hand. I mean, you got to say that Campbell did his job and Georgia did its job there as well. And the possibility that it could have been more, maybe it could, but I mean, you know, you, you pluck a five star and three years later, he's first round pick. Yeah. That, that, that to me is everybody kind of doing their job. And some of what led Campbell to maybe being less than he could have been at Georgia was the fact that Georgia had no better option to start the 2018 season than Tyson. And the fact that he was pretty banged up for most of the 2019 season, even in that sec championship game in 2019, when Georgia had, 15 defensive backs in the field for most of the game. Campbell wasn't really one of those either. He just wasn't healthy enough to play. Uh, Corey Doyle, very funny line. Rocky top, looks like Rocky bottom. Uh, Wyatt Fielden says, don't you think Arkansas will be replaced for next year's schedule? Why? I think that's a really good question. I would say that I'm probably expecting it to be the schedule that we thought it was going to be because, look, this the SEC just... <laughs> You start changing things up too much. People just get mad. They start fighting. I mean, there was so much infighting uh, prior to the schedule release for the 2020 season that you got to be that, that if, if you make too many changes, rotational changes, people get really upset. So my guess is why that Arkansas is still on Georgia's schedule, even though Arkansas, even though Georgia went to Arkansas a year ago, Georgia will just play them two years in a row if I had to guess. But. The caveat to all of that is, is I am definitely on guard for the possibility that something could be different. I am definitely looking out for the possibility that rotational opponents are not the same. And if they're not, you're talking about holy hell breaking out because you know who uh, Florida's rotational opponent is supposed to be Alabama. So um, that's an example of, you know, you just better be on guard for anything. But I'm expecting it's going to probably be a fairly traditional schedule release but but that's definitely one of the things I'm looking to see is Georgia's rotational opponent, Arkansas, the way that we think it's going to be. Um, Tristan West says uh, Florida will win 10 games, only losses coming to Bama and Georgia. He says the East will not be as strong after Missouri and us. Another person talking about Missouri. We've had a lot of Missouri talk in the comments section lately. Uh, that guy says Georgia beats Florida by 17 next season. You better believe Eddie would love that. You better believe he'd love that. Um, let's see what else is going on. Alex Howard also looking at the down SEC East. Could be down. I mean, I don't expect much from Tennessee. Don't expect much from Kentucky. Uh, obviously, you know, Vanderbilt would be lucky to even field a team. 
Yeah, that's about it. That's about it. Yep, about it. I mean, I, th- I think that Florida is still probably a challenge, obviously, but uh, maybe so. Frederick Meredith says, I think that Georgia's defensive backfield going to exceed expectations next year behind leadership of Lewisine and Christopher Smith. I do like Smith a lot. I like him a lot. GB2 says, after we handled it, Clemson in week one, does that move us to number one? I think that GB2 is on something here. Not... <laughs> Not on something. I think he's on to something is what I mean to say. He may be on something too, but if he is, it's working. Um, That Georgia will probably not start the season as preseason number one, but they will be close enough to it that they could leap to number one by beating Clemson. I think they probably should. Even with, you know, the idea of maybe no one should be ranked ahead of Alabama, just given how good Alabama was last year, despite the fact they didn't really bring back much in the way of experience. Uh, the chances of Georgia being number one after beating a team like Clemson are probably pretty high. Killa Mime says, anything new on a Rick Gilbert? No, I got nothing. I got nothing. I mean, I guess I'm more open to the possibility that he might even go back to LSU. We talked about that with uh, with Terrence Edwards a little bit last week. I'm not saying it's not happening. I'm not saying he's not coming to Georgia, but um, but it's not happening anytime soon. I can say that. There's no uh, seemingly connection between the start of spring semester which has already happened at georgia even drop ad now is over i believe no connection between that and a gilbert announcement that if he's coming he's coming you know later on which means he can either just show up or kind of not come at all so uh i'm assuming that gilbert's still taking classes at lsu right now and obviously assumptions can be wrong but i'm assuming that's the case that won't i think prohibit him from from deciding to go somewhere else, but the longer he goes without making a decision to a new school, the longer it becomes a possibility that he could be convinced to to not make that. You know, the one thing that we laughed at at the time, and I think has been proven to be worthy of of mocking, was the notion that it was a done deal that he was going to Florida. That's obviously not the case, but it's also honesty compels me to admit not a done deal that he's coming to UGA either. GB2 says, does he have to be enrolled in spring to play in the fall? I'm not an academic expert. I'm sure many of you are surprised to hear that, but I don't believe that's the case. As long as he's, you know, as long as he's all taken care of as far as like what the academic progress needs to be, I believe he can transfer in and kind of be ready to go. I believe as long as the SEC approves it. Because remember, that's the other thing here. This is not a graduate transfer. This is a regular transfer. And we were told last year that the Cade Mays, Otis Reese transfers, things like that were one-time exceptions. So the other thing that Gilbert would have to deal with is he'd have to deal with getting his transfer approved wherever it is that he goes, assuming he goes in the SEC. Uh, Foster Moss says, who you got, B.A., Brady, or Mahomes? I got to go with Kansas City here, I guess. That offense is hard to stop. I I guess I'm going with Kansas City there on that. Uh, As a person in his 40s, though, I do like it when guys in their 40s have success. Uh, That guy says, watch your Rick Gilbert end up at Clemson. Maybe so, that guy, but Clemson doesn't really take a lot of transfers. So that would be a new thing for them if they kind of did. Daniel Borden says, will we get spring practices this year? Daniel, my expectation is that we will see spring practices, and it'll be a relatively traditional spring, I'm guessing. I'm not really quite sure what to expect from G-Day yet. I know there's some online chatter about that. I'm not really quite sure what to expect from that yet. But uh, some version of a spring practice, you know, more normal than not, I'm thinking that probably happens. And if anything, Georgia's shown that it can kind of handle that kind of stuff. So... Um, I think spring practice would be crucial. My guess is Georgia gets a chance to have it. By the way, here's something kind of cool. Coastal Carolina started 2021 spring practice yesterday. So for those of you ready for something that feels like the start of the 2021 season, you got a little bit of that yesterday from the Chanticleers. We're going to get ready to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Langsky's eyebrow is a little hard there on Mark Webb. You can say, you know, Stuff about Webb if you want to, but I mean, I think Webb has a very good chance to be on an NFL roster too. Frederick Meredith says he thinks the Clemson might make an exception for bringing in Rick Gilbert. They very well might. I know that he was interested in Clemson the first time around. 
Texas Dog says Gilbert does not need to take spring classes to be eligible for the fall. There are recruits that won't come in until the summer, and they won't be, uh, and they will be eligible in the fall. So uh, Texas Dog kind of weighing in on that. Appreciate that, Texas. Um, let me do a couple more. David Harvey says, once Georgia wins a national championship, hold on, guys. Recruits will come in bunches, and they certainly probably will. That's why this season is so important for Georgia. I don't think it closes a championship window. I think that Georgia is still very much in the thick of the race for many years to come. But but obviously, when you look at what Georgia has going for it right now, it's difficult to imagine there'll be many more years when they have better opportunities than what seems to be on paper right now. Jacob O'Neill, thanks for being here today. Appreciate that. Brew dogs having some fun in the Facebook comment section. No comment from me, but have but having some fun. Joe Moody uh, on um, the Chiefs and the Bucks matchup there. Let's see what else. David Harvey says, "I'm a blasphemer." He says, "Brady all the way." I guess I'm probably rooting for Brady, as I said before, because he's, you know, 40-plus-year-old guy, much like your humble host here. Jeremy Chapman says the thing that seems to separate Bama from everyone else is how prepared their second-string players seem to be when it's time for them to take the starting jobs. Do you know that Alabama last season, Jeremy, I think you're bringing up a really good point, was like bottom five in the country at the start of the 2020 season in returning production from 2019. Bottom, not 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 bottom fifth of the country, the bottom five. They're only there. Are 125 teams in America that was bringing back more than Alabama was bringing back, and yet this may have been their best team ever. So yeah, they have been really good at that. And I don't know, you know, it's like sometimes you see this in the NBA where you know guys are just better players on good teams. You put them on a bad team, they don't play as well. Players play better in a, on a good team. I don't know if it's the same thing in college football as well, where. You know, development happens quicker and easier when you have, you know, such high expectations around you and so much achievement going on around you that somehow that that achievement becomes contagious. I really don't know what that is, but but clearly there is a lot of that at Alabama. And I have definitely noticed that. And that's obviously what George is chasing and to a certain degree trying to replicate there as well. (laughs) Very funny comment from Ben Green. Um, Joel Moody uh, talking about Greg Blue. I don't know if uh, if you're talking about the same thing. I think you are not. But there's also some highlights out there of Jamal Adai as a player at West Virginia. Boy, he was a Greg Blue style player himself. So that may be what you're referencing, but if it's not, that's what kind of brings to mind for me. One more from YouTube, and then we're going to leave. That guy says Stafford to San Francisco. Is that a prediction or is that happening? Because if it did, Stafford and Kyle Shanahan's offense, y'all better watch out. I better print the T-shirts if that be the case. Um, GB2 says, would I really root against a uh, UJ alum in the Super Bowl, meaning McCall Hartman? I guess I probably wouldn't. The truth is I haven't really thought that much about it. But you're probably right. I probably would root for Hardman um, in that case. Nature Gator says the only D.C. job must champ would accept would be in the NFL. Who hires him as a college head coach now? No Power 5 program. Maybe some program like UCF. I could see him there. He's a good recruiter. So I agree with some of what you say and and not some of what you say. Uh, for now, I do think you're right that Muschamp is not interested in being a defensive coordinator. That I think that he wants to shop around the job market and see you know where it is. You say no Power 5 program would want to hire him. We may turn out in a couple of years that's true. But I'd suspect a guy who's been a head coach at two different places before would get that chance to be considered for a third time. Now, it may be farther down the trough outside the SEC, you know, more of the, you know, the middling, you know, Power 5 level, but still Power 5 and still, you know, plenty of opportunity to, you know, make good money and, you know, be a factor, go to bowl games, things like that. So I would assume that Muschamp probably knows that he's not a hot name for coaching interviews right now, but not someone who has to you know, rush and take a job. As we compared before yesterday, you know, the difference between like Matt Luke, who had been head coach at Ole Miss, and Will Muschamp is that Muschamp had been a head coach in the SEC for a good number of years. He had made a lot of money. Luke, by comparison, just hadn't made nearly as much money. He may needed to have worked uh, and was maybe glad to get that job at Georgia for a chance to do 
do so. Not to get into his pocketbook, but that may be, you know, what the situation was there. Muschamp's case, he may have the financial freedom to be a little bit more choosy about his next job. And after a couple of years of the phone not ringing, if it that's what happens, then maybe at that point in time he says, okay, where can I go be a defensive coordinator again and, you know, and just enjoy the coaching life? Um, so Muschamp's got some options available to him, but I'm not ready to say that Muschamp won't be a head coach again. It may not be the kind of level of program that we talk about in the show on a very regular basis, but but it could very well be a Power 5 head coaching job again. Um, all right, let's go. VTW also mentioning Aaron Rodgers maybe leaving Green Bay. Yeah, you got Jordan Love waiting the wings. Rodgers always seems to be unhappy. That's probably one worth watching there as well. Um, all right, so uh, thank you all for being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. Let me also remind you to check out the AJC, Atlanta News Now at AJC.com. There is a lot going on when it comes to the virus rollout. Not the virus rollout. The virus rolled out a long time ago. The vaccine rollout. Those two V words are confusing to me. The vaccine rollout. A lot going on with that. I am not going to talk to you about any of it here, but you probably need to know what's going on. So Atlanta News Now, AJC.com. That is where you can get some more on that. Uh, also, a really good piece from my buddy Chip Towers looking at uh, – I mentioned before Hank Aaron being from Mobile, Alabama, uh, legendary former Georgia coach and athletic director Vince Dooley also hails from Mobile as well. And Dooley and Aaron had a bit of a special connection. And Chip writes about that at dog, excuse me, at AJC.com. You can read about that on there as well. And just a bunch more stuff there as well. Atlanta News Now at AJC.com. Make sure you uh, check that out. Huge thanks to our friends at R.S. Andrews, making the R.S. Andrews cool down possible. You can trust R.S. Andrews for air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electrical needs. You know, when you bring them out to your house to work on something related to one of those systems, their technicians show up on time, do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. R.S. Andrews has been delivering smiles. Story after story, they've been delivering these smiles. They can deliver one for you as well. But you need to find them online at rsandrews.com. Tell Darian and the whole team we said hello over there and that we told you to put them to work for you. And I promise they'll take good care of you. Thanks for being here. R.S. Andrews Cool Down, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Harris Cherokee Casino Resort. We'll see you back here at 10 a.m. tomorrow.